God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we get to turn our attention now, this time. As we continue to engage in our worship service, Lord, we don't think that we sit idly by at this moment. Instead, we are actively listening to hear your voice. So, Father, open our ears and our hearts that we may hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the word of our Lord from Exodus chapter 20, the, just the first two verses. So, go ahead and turn over there if you wouldn't mind. We'll come back to it, but hear the word of our Lord. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Katie and I were still in the process of unpacking our boxes, of course. We've been in the house just about a month or so, maybe two months. Sometimes the days get confused. And I've heard some of you tell me that you've been in the home for 30 years and you're still unpacking. So we'll be unpacking, it looks like, for quite some time. But I was going through a box the other day and I found an old iPhone. And I usually don't keep old iPhones. I usually trade them in. As a matter of fact, there was one time there when they were coming out with iPhones so many times, I could sell the old one and buy the new one. But anyway, I usually don't keep iPhones, but I did find this one. And this iPhone doesn't even charge anymore, but I have to keep it. And the reason that I have to keep it is because inside that iPhone, I know, is a voice recording from my granddad. It's the last recording that I remember having of my granddad. He called me and left me a voice message. I called him when we moved back to Georgia from North Carolina. I called him to get his advice on how to do a certain task. And I really didn't need advice on how to do the certain task. I just wanted to call him. And so I did. And he told me how to do something. And then the next thing I know, he's calling me back while I'm out in the yard doing it. And he's telling me further instructions on how to make sure that it's done just right. I can still hear his voice in my head telling me what he told me. And as we moved to Mississippi, my granddad, he was an old farm boy. And thinking about now having a little bit of property, I sure do wish that I could call him and ask him what I could do here or when I could do it. But I just can't get rid of that. I can't throw it away, even though it can't charge. I still have to keep it because inside that little box is a voice from the past, my granddaddy's voice. And if I love to have those conversations again with him to hear his voice, what's it going to be like, I wonder, when I hear God's voice? What's it going to be like when I hear God's voice? You see, you and I this morning, we get this opportunity today to hear the voice of God, and that's what we just did. When we came and we had this moment of expectation where we opened the Bible and we said, hear the word of the Lord. When we turn our attention towards Scripture, we turn our attention towards God speaking. And in particular this morning, we turn our time to a time that God spoke audibly ten words, or what we call the Ten Commandments. And then we, when we look at the time that God spoke, we see what it looks like when He spoke. It looked like the heavens were being torn down. Exodus chapter 19 tells the story. It tells us that when God spoke on this day, there was, thun there was thunder, there was lightning, it was loud, and there was a shaking, not only of the people as they trembled, but there was also a shaking of the mountain as the voice of its creator descended upon the mountain. And so today, we get the privilege of coming together and hearing God's voice. I wonder if that's the way that you approach Scripture. I wonder if that's the way that you understand what you do when you approach God's holy Word. Do you consider Scripture as the vox day, as the voice of God? Now, I long to hear His voice on the last day, and it's through Scripture that I know that what… it's through Scripture that I know what God is going to say to me. Have you ever thought about that? I'm living my life with this anticipation of hearing God's voice, and it's through hearing His voice I can anticipate what He's going to say 
to me. You say, what's He going to say to you? He's going to say to me, listen, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. (sighs) That sounds like arrogance to me. How can you be so confident that God is going to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? This is an arrogance. I know that that's what God is going to say to me because I have placed my faith in my Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here today, God will say the same thing to you. He will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master or, or. He'll say to you another word. He'll say to you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. You say, how can you know what God will say? The way that you know what God will say is because the Bible tells us so. And I have rested my eternal destiny on what God says, and I hope that you have too. As hard as it is for us to imagine, I know some of you, you're still not convinced. As hard as it is for us to imagine, you and I today are in a better position than the children of Israel were in Exodus chapter 19. What had happened in Exodus chapter 19? Remember, they heard the thunder. They felt the shake. They heard the voice of God. But we are in a better position than they are. You say, how can that be? I would have much rather have been there so that I could put all of my doubts aside and just hear the voice of God audibly for myself. Well, Peter says, the Apostle Peter, who, by the way, walked with the Lord, who heard the voice, who saw the miracles, who heard of the resurrection, who saw Jesus die, who saw Him rise again. Peter says, we have the prophetic word more Sure. Listen to this passage he says in 2 Peter chapter 1. Listen to what he says. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when the Lord, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then listen to what he says. For when he received glory and honor from God, the Father, the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, I was there. I heard it. And listen to what he says next. He's writing to Christians far removed from the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, anticipating the second coming. He said, I was with him on the mountain, I heard the voice, and then listen to what he says next. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And then listen to what he says next, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter says, you hear what he said? He says, you and I are in a better position than they were. And the reason is, is because we stand on this position. We get to see them making the mistakes. We get to see them not approaching God, even though they're invited to come. We get to see them not approaching because of their fear. We get to read the stories of the Gospels, and we get to see Peter making a mess of things. Remember Peter? This is the guy who Jesus, in in the same little story, he says, who do men say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And then Jesus says, boy, you sure are blessed. And then in the next couple of lines, Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. Peter says, no way. And in the next little line, Jesus calls Peter, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Now, it's a terrible thing to be called Satan by the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is what happened to Peter. Peter says, you and I are in a better position because we have the prophetic word more sure. And then Peter says, pay attention to it. 
And what's he talking about? The prophetic word, more sure. He's talking about holy Scripture. We do as God says, not as they did. And today, the Bible says, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the day of rebellion. In other words, listen to His voice today. I don't know how you view the Bible, but I'm going to tell you this plain and simple. The Bible is the Word of God. That's important. The Bible is the Word of God. It doesn't contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. All the words, not just the red words, not just the black words, all the words, maybe your Bible has green letters in it, I don't know, all of those colors are the Word of God, and in it, God reveals Himself to us. Jesus said in Matthew, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will stand forever. The Word of the Lord is forever. Now, look at this text this morning before you. Look at Exodus chapter 20. Why are you paying so much attention on God's Word? Because the Ten Commandments, before they're ever called Ten Commandments, they're called Ten Words. Ten Words. These are God's Ten Words. Look at Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying… And so, what I want to do from the Bible this morning, I want to point out three truths about God speaking. I've entitled this message, and hopefully you've got the brochure and the guide, you're following along. I've entitled this message, When God Speaks, and that's going to be the heading of every one of our points. Number one, write this down, when God speaks, number one, life is formed. Life is formed. There are ten words before us, but I want you to see this transition of the chapter. Look at chapter 19, for example, and look at verse 24. And remember this, the chapter divisions in your Bible, those verses, they make it easy for us to call in to the attention of where we're looking. I'm asking you to look at Exodus chapter 20. That makes it easy. I'm not having you say, all right, flip three-quarters of the way in your Bible. I'm not asking you to do that. Those chapter divisions were added in the 1500s so that students of the Bible could find their place, and the professor wasn't spending so much time all like talking to me, saying, oh, Andy, just get to it. Why can't you just find it? But remember this, when God wrote the narrative, He didn't write it with chapter divisions and verses. So listen to the way the transition reads. I want you to hear it. Look at verse 24 of Exodus 19. Notice the transition. And the Lord spoke, and the Lord said to him, verse 24, go down, come up bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. Now look at verse 25. So Moses went down to the people and told them, and God spoke all these words, saying, did you catch that transition? Did you catch that difference? From Moses to God. God speaking through Moses to the people. And this is the point that I want you to learn from that. God does the same thing to us today. And the medium by which God speaks to us, listen carefully, is the Spirit-inspired Word is the Spirit-inspired Word. And I wonder this morning if you long to hear God speak. Can you imagine anything sweeter than hearing the Word of God? That's exactly what we're doing. We are turning all of our attention, hopefully, quit thinking about that thing, turn it back to the Bible. We're turning all of our attention on the Word of God. I don't know about you, but this is the highlight of my week. (laughs) And it's not so much me standing up here and you looking at me and me looking at you. It's not those things. It's that we get to come together collectively as a church 
and I know what you demand of me. You don't want me to sit up here and tell funny stories and funny jokes. You want me to give you the Word of God. And that's exactly what I want to give you. Because the Word of God forms life. Look particularly. Go back to Exodus 19 for just a moment. Look particularly at verses 18 through 19. Look at chapter 19. And look at verse 18 through 19. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. The whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke. And God answered him in thunder. What a scene. Can you imagine what it must have been like? Here the mountain is shaking, thunder and lightning. Moses speaks. And in the middle of all that, God hears him. That's a miracle. God heard Moses through all the noise. And God can hear you through all the noise, too. God can hear when you cry to Him through your tears. He can hear through your anger, through your fear. All of those moments, that many moments of chaos and swirl, they don't deafen God. He can hear. And not only can He hear, He listens, and often He's speaking, even when it's noisy. Look at verse 20 of Exodus 19. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Friends, I want to tell you this morning that God is speaking through the noise of our day. There is so much noise in our world. There is the pandemic noise, the noise that the pandemic has created. There's presidential elections that have created noise. There is unrest in the Middle East that is causing all kind of noise. Hackers are creating noise. Secularism is creating noise. Humanism and a dozen other isms are all creating noise. And in the middle of all of that noise and chaos, God is speaking. Can you hear Him? You say, what's He saying? He's saying the same thing that he has said, and he has always said. Look here at these commandments. What's he saying? Look at verse 3 of chapter 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of our fathers on the children in the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, You or your sons or your daughters and male servants, female servants, livestock, sojourners who is in the gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the sea and all that's in them rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord God is giving to you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. Ten words. Ten words. And we've seen God speak ten words before. If you were to go back in your Bible and do this as a little exercise, go back all the way to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. 
It's not the first page in my Bible, by the way. You've got to go through the table of contents and the copyright page and editor's notes and all these. But anyway, Genesis chapter 1. We've seen God speak ten words before. We won't do this this morning, but I want to at least call your attention to it. Count the number of times Genesis chapter 1 records this phrase, and God said. And you know what you're going to find? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten words. Now, that's no coincidence. We have ten words in the beginning, and then we have ten words here at Exodus chapter 20. God is insisting that what He's saying in the Ten Commandments are life-giving words. God is detailing what life with Him looks like. And this God who spoke creation into being speaks from the mountain, and His words are life. This God who stood above the earth and spoke now speaks on the mountain. Moses is going to tell his people later in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. You shall walk in the ways of the Lord your God has commanded you, listen, that you may live, and it go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. So these words that God are speaking are life-giving words. But what kind of life is God forming when He speaks these ten words? God is forming, listen, life with Him. God speaks these words and places them on tablets of stone. He's up on the mountain. He's still inaccessible. But this God on the mountain is soon going to come down in amazing grace. As the sun takes on flesh and pitches his tent among us. Now, here in Exodus chapter 20, we've already seen in Exodus chapter 19, the people are pitching their tent. They're worshiping God on the mountain. But soon, the God of the mountain is going to come down, and He's going to invite them to come up with Him. He speaks law first to prepare us for grace because His law has already been broken. There's one more, th- the last word that God says in Genesis chapter 1. He's going to say to them, here's the fruit, don't take it. And what happens as a result of that? God has one word for them, don't take that fruit. Trust me, the day that you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. Trust me, don't take the fruit. Do they listen to God? As a result of that, the transgression of one word, God adds Ten words. Ten words. Because the people are radically fallen away from His grace. They are, they have transgressed His law, but still He hasn't given up on them. Still He hasn't given up on you. Still He hasn't given up on me. He saves, but He doesn't just save, does He? He saves and he commands. It was Charles Spurgeon who said something like this, the law is the needle that goes in first, sharp and piercing, but the law pulls silver threads of grace. The God of creation who created all things new is also this God of salvation. And in order for us to walk with Him, He has to redeem us. This is what He's going to do. This is what He has done. And He takes the Israelites to the mountain to worship. And before He speaks, He establishes again the basis of His relationship. Look at chapter 20 and verse 2. I am the Lord your God 
who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Number two, when God speaks, number two, He reminds us of grace. How sweet to be reminded of grace. And there's many of you that resist the message of grace. You look at these Ten Commandments, and you look at them with, without grace. You look at the Ten Commandments apart from redemption, and you set out to climb this mountain on your own apart from grace. And so you look at this list, you say, Ten? I can do that. That's no problem. Just ten? That's all it takes? I can climb this mountain. So you say, if I could just do a little more, then. Or you say, if I could just be a little better, then. But you know what the problem with that kind of logic is? You can never do enough. What does it take to please God? How much is enough? There's nothing that you can do to save yourselves. This is why God gives us grace. And grace gives us what we don't deserve. Grace means that we receive what we don't deserve just at the time when we needed it the most. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. God gives it. He gives grace because He loves, and His love is astounding. And His grace, it's amazing. And apart from redemption, you can never walk with God. You see, when God redeems, He gets right at the heart of the matter. When God redeems, He gets right at the heart. I remember reading a story of a tribesman who heard the Ten Commandments, and he said, I would much rather have my 700 commandments to please my God than these 10 to please your God. Because this tribesman, he says what we often say, with all of these other commandments, I can find loophole after loophole after loophole after loophole. But God says, these are my 10 words, and he speaks those 10 words because he gets right at the heart of the matter. God isn't interested in you doing it. He wants you to want to do it. My children are with me this morning, and as much as I love being their daddy, and I'm so grateful that I get this privilege of being their daddy, and oftentimes I have to command them to do something. And sometimes I do it just like that. I command them to do something. But you know what I want more than them to do what I've asked them to do? I want them to want to do it. And that's hard. God wants the same for you. He doesn't want you to just do all these things. He doesn't need your obedience. He doesn't need, he doesn't, he doesn't need it. Not like there's something missing from God, and so he has to, you know, his little meter, his godness meter is a little empty, and so he needs more people to worship him to fill up that meter, and then he can become more powerful. That's not it. Instead, God desires your desiring of him. And that's what these Ten Commandments do. They stretch out our hearts. This is why Jesus comes. And interestingly, Jesus comes and He speaks from another mountain. And what's He say? He said, you've heard that it was said, but I say. You know what He's doing? He's not adding to the law. He's not correcting the law. He's, not, he's showing the people what they've missed all along. He's getting to the heart of the matter. He's showing that this is the intention of the law. Whatever you've been taught, this system where you think that you can just go about and resist and just get a little bit by and go to the next sacrifice or come to the next church service and get a little bit further down the road, Jesus gets at the heart of the matter and says, no, no, guys, it's not about all of those rules and regulations. It's about you having the heart of a worshiper, the heart that delights to obey. And it's in, and the only way that you can have a heart that delights to obey is through redemption. You have to be redeemed. And in redemption, God captures your heart. What's He say? I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who rescued you. You were in the house of slavery. I brought you out. Rule keeping, legalism is self-serving, it's self-seeking, but we've received redemption. 
we're the redeemed. And the next action that we take, listen, don't miss this. The next action that we take as those who are redeemed, the next step that we take is from redemption. It's from redemption. We always are in response, we're always responding to what He has done. What has He done? He saves. He creates new. He gives us, listen to this language, He gives us the capacity, the power, according to the Spirit, to stand atop the mountain, to ascend the mountain of the Lord. And we stand at the top of the mountain as the redeemed, as the forgiven, as sons and as daughters of God, who by faith are joint heirs to the heights of heaven. Not because of our perfect obedience, but because of Jesus' perfect obedience. You see, Jesus, beloved, He isn't just our example to follow. He isn't just our Lord to obey. He's our Savior who redeems us and causes us to walk with Him. He Himself enables our redemption. So you look at these commandments this morning, and these commandments, they're not chains on your hands. They're not chains on your feet. They're more like a new pair of shoes or a fine coat. It's a new identity because it's through Jesus. It's through Jesus. Don't miss that. It's all because of Jesus. It's through Jesus. They not only represent an ideal to walk towards, but they are the true statements of our redemption. What has Jesus accomplished? Look at the Ten Commandments. This is what He's accomplished. It's through Jesus and because of the Spirit that you and I can obey. Before we couldn't, but now we have the capacity, we have the power to do it. And this is what it means to walk with Jesus, beloved. Look at the Ten Commandments. This is what it means to walk with God. And anything else is out of step. Literally, it causes you to strip up. It's out of step. We have no need to walk as we used to because we have the Word of God and we have the Spirit of God. Yesterday, I was, I was cutting my grass, and I finally made it around the barn. I finally made it down into the field, very precarious, but I made it down into the field. Man, I wish I could tell you the whole story, but I made it down there. And I was, walk, I was going around the barn, and I saw, as I was riding the mower, I saw that there was a rope in the way. Not a rope tied, it was just a simple rope sitting there. And I knew that it was going to be risky, but I did it anyway. I went over the rope, and guess what happened? <laughs> A little more cut off. I'm like, what in the world? Well, I knew. I didn't have to ask. I knew exactly what happened. That rope got twisted, tied around, all of those contraptions, blades moving around. That little more died. Wouldn't go any further. I saw the rope. I made a choice. <laughs> I ran over the rope. I crossed the line. And as a result of that, my progress was stopped dead in its tracks. The blades would no longer rotate. There was something hindering their progress. So you know what I had to do? Thankfully, my brother was in town. It's his birthday today. He's my older brother. He's 45. But anyway, uh, I, had to take, I had to take the lawnmower, and I had to, my brother, he got underneath the lawnmower. I had to pull the lawnmower up, and I'm, he's under the lawnmower, and I'm thinking, man, this thing sure is shaking a lot. But anyway, he got the rope out, he was able to cut the rope. It took us 30 minutes at least to get that rope untangled. I knew the rope was there. I took a risk. And as a result, my progress was stopped. 
if I would have only stopped and addressed the rope. You see, God reminds us of grace when He speaks to us this morning, but don't forget number three, when God speaks, He doesn't waver from His standard. He doesn't waver from His standard. This is the God on the mountain. He's holy. He's lofty. He doesn't lower His standards. We are transgressors. We have not walked with God according to His ways. The Bible says all of us have sinned, listen to the language, and fallen short of the glory of God. We need a Savior. We need redemption. And these ten words are His standards. Either you live up to them or you don't. These ten words are life-giving words. They're grace-filled words. These words represent God's desire to have a relationship with you. Otherwise, He wouldn't have written them. He didn't write them so that He could say, "Ah, see, I told you. He doesn't owe you an explanation. He doesn't owe me an explanation. He has written His law so that we could look at His law and see how far from Him we were. And then this God who speaks the law also speaks to you, realizing how far you are from Him. But you know what He says? I'll forgive you. I'll restore you. I'll redeem you. Did you call out to me? You see, these words, they aren't meant to push you away. They're written to draw you in. And today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Don't say, I'll wait. Don't say, I'll try it my way. The Word of the Lord It's forever. I wish you knew how close you were to salvation. How close you were to redemption. It's as close to you, listen, as a call away. You see this Jesus that I'm telling you about? He is more ready to save you than you are to ask Him to. But to any who come to Him, He says, by no means will I cast out. Listen. He's calling for you. Call out to Him. Father in heaven, thank You for Your Word. And I pray, Lord God, if there's one here today, if there's one watching us or listening, if they don't know you, may today be the day of that glorious introduction where they meet this God of their salvation. Save them. Cause them to cry to you. Redeem them. In Jesus' name, amen.